Welcome to the week three lecture for abnormal psychology. This week, we're covering diagnosis and assessment. As we cover this section of the course, our main goal is to get a better understanding of how, or the methods, psychologists make sense of an individual's psychological problems. Last week, we talked about the why of psychological disorders. But remember, each individual is different, and each disorder that they experience is different, along with the causes for that disorder. So what are the methods that psychologists use to understand those problems? And how do we give a label to them? How do we call uh, something a psychological disorder? Let's start with the diagnosis part, what we call a disorder, and what differentiates one disorder from another. This falls under the broad category of case conceptualization. It's important to recognize that diagnosis is just one piece of that case conceptualization. When we're talking about case conceptualization, we're talking about an understanding of the reason why an individual is suffering from the psychological problems that they experience. Their diagnosis is a label for those problems, but what goes into it is also their individual experiences. What does it look like for them? What were the causes for them? What was their past, their experience, their beliefs, that led to this diagnosis. We also want to think about psychological theory. Psychological theory is also going to help us understand the causes, the reasons why. So remember, diagnosis is just one piece of case conceptualization, and it's the label piece. The way we label disorders at the current time is by using the DSM the Diagnostic and Statistical Manual of Mental Disorders. Now this is a, a book published by the American Psycho Psychiatric Association. Don't confuse it with the American Psychological Association, but it's published by the Psychiatric Association, primarily uh, the Association for Psychiatrists. It's a medical association rather than the Association for Psychologists. But in the field, psychologist, we use this book as well. The first edition of this Bush book was published in 1952. It included 106 identified disorders. And at that time, they called them reactions. And these were just very basic descriptions. Uh, for example, they had schizophrenic reactions, which was uh, it said it represented a group of psychotic disorders characterized by fundamental disturbances in reality relationships and concept formations with effective behavioral and intellectual disturbances in varying degrees and mixtures. The disorders are marked by strong tendency to retreat from reality, by emotional disharmony, unpredictable disturbances in stream of thought, aggressive behavior, and in some, a tendency to deterioration. You notice in this definition, uh, it's just giving a general description and telling some of the characteristics that are often associated with schizophrenia. And that's what the earliest edition was, just general descriptions of what doctors and care providers might see when an individual has a psychotic disorder. Today, we're on the fifth edition of the DSM. It was actually published in 2013, so about five years ago. In the this edition, there are now 347 different identified disorders. And rather than just giving a, a general description, a paragraph about each one and what might be, uh, what it might look like, the current DSM spells out very specifically what are the symptoms how, and what are the criteria, how many symptoms are necessary in order for an individual to get a diagnosis. So let's look at that same disorder, schizophrenia, and how it's defined today. 
You can see very specific. It tells what the symptoms are. So delusions, hallucinations, disorganized speech, grossly disorganized or catatonic behavior, and negative symptoms. And in addition to telling what the symptoms are, it tells specifically how many symptoms a person must have. Two or more of those symptoms. And then finally, it tells a period or a time period for how long the symptoms must be present. So a month period uh, have to have at least uh, one of those two symptoms. It also gives details about difficulty with functioning and continuous disturbance for at least one month. And then finally, the current DSM also provides rule outs. Other disorders that a psychologist would consider if an individual has some of these symptoms and just making sure the psychologist that uh, it's not these other disorders instead of schizophrenia. So you can see the current DSM much more specific, uh, much more kind of detailed about what meets criteria for a disorder and what does not. The current DSM also includes for each disorder the di a description of the diagnostic features. So what does that actually look like in individuals? How do those symptoms show up? It also talks about associated features supporting the diagnosis. So these are things that may not be a symptom, but we generally see in individuals when they have the disorder. It gives estimates of prevalence of the disorders within the population. So a psychologist or psychiatrist or other mental health care provider can have a general idea about how often they might see it in their clients. It further gives information about development and course, details about when the disorder typically shows up for individuals, when it would go away on its own, what's likely to happen if there is no intervention or treatment. It further gives information about risk and prognostic factors, are uh, certain environmental situations more likely to cause the disorder to show up. and what's likely to happen to the individual uh, with the given disorder. There's also a discussion in the current DSM or details in it that talk about culture and gender related issues with that disorder. Are males more likely to experience it or females? Does it look different in one culture or another? And then finally, the DSM-5 has a section for each disorder on comorbidity. And that means what other disorders are commonly seen with the disorder that it's talking about. In addition to the main disorders in the DSM, the 390 some disorders or 347 disorders, the DSM does have other, er other things, other conditions that it says pay attention to. So these are things like problems related to family upbringing. It may not lead to depression or anxiety, but there's still some problem in the individual's functioning that should be considered related to that upbringing. Or child maltreatment, or housing and economic problems. Finally, the DSM-5 has a section that talks about conditions for further study. So these are uh, disorders that they don't quite know enough about yet. There's not enough research to say this is a, a disorder, but they have a hunch or based on the experiences or the research so far, they have an idea that maybe in the future we might actually classify these as a disorder. A couple examples of them are caffeine use disorder, when an individual seems to be addicted to caffeine or persistent complex bereavement disorder. When an individual's grief after losing a loved one uh, kind of extends beyond what might be normal or expected when somebody has uh, a family member or loved one die.
Now, like I mentioned, the current DSM, it's relatively new, just five years old, and there has been a lot of controversy uh, since it's come out. Even before it came out in the development of the DSM-5, there was a lot of controversy. A lot of people say that there are just too many psychological disorders. With almost 350 disorders now, um, people argue that almost everybody is going to meet criteria for a disorder. Compared to the original DSM, when only the most severe kind of problematic um, disorders were identified. A second controversy about the current T DSM is a lot of people argue that its development was done in secret. Uh, the individuals who were on the task force for each of the disorders and developing the criteria for the disorders, uh, originally they were um, a a asked to sign an agreement that they wouldn't share kind of that development process, that they wouldn't talk about it with others. And a lot of psychologists and psychiatrists uh, disagreed with that. They felt like it wasn't using the knowledge, uh, the rich knowledge and uh, kind of um, support or evidence that many people could provide uh, surrounding these disorders. The cynical people with this uh, kind of look at the secrecy and believe it has uh, to do with connections with pharmaceutical companies. The individuals who developed the DSM, uh, after kind of they they took down kind of those secrecy uh, requirements, and people started looking at who the individuals were. About seventy percent of them had ties to pharmaceutical co companies, and so with that kind of criticism that perhaps the DSM and the disorders that we have now uh, were somewhat developed in a way that would lead to more people taking medications and using medications, psychotropic medications. A third criticism is with the reliability. When they finished and, and had come up with all the criteria for the different disorders in DSM-5, uh, they pilot tested it. They asked, it, asked different psychologists uh, to see clients and then um, give them diagnoses based on that DSM. And they found that for some disorders, the reliability between psychologists and between psychiatrists and, and so on was very poor. An individual might have gone to one psychologist and gotten one disorder and a different psychologist and gotten a completely different diagnosis. And uh, for some disorders, there was a moderate overlap, but for some of the disorders that are currently in the DSM-5, there was no overlap between the raters at all. So there's been a lot of criticism with that reliability. And then finally, uh, several people have argued that the DSM-5 does not adequately consider culture. It's focused on one kind of way of, of thinking about these disorders, and uh, people feel like culture should play a bigger role. Again, from our last lecture, what's a disorder in one culture might actually be seen as a, a strength in another. I want us to think about for a second the value of having these diagnostic labels. So based on the DSM, an individual goes in to see a psychologist, a psychiatrist, social worker, counselor, whoever. The individual will share about their problems and that psychologist, that mental health provider, will be able to listen to those problems and, and listen to the symptoms and come up with a diagnostic label for the individual. So that label might be major depressive disorder, or it might be schizophrenia, or it might be bipolar disorder, or panic disorder, and so on. Now there are certain benefits that come with having those diagnostic labels. First, it facilitates communication. If I have a client that I'm seeing and I'm trying to provide psychotherapy for this client, but this client also needs medication and I want to refer this client to a psychiatrist to provide that medication, 
I'm not going to have time to be able to describe the client's whole background and history and, and give a really rich and detailed description to that psychiatrist. I'm busy, I have several clients, and that psychiatrist is busy with several clients as well. And so, by being able to tell this client has bipolar disorder, that psychiatrist automatically has an initial impression that they can be able to then base their treatment off of. Second, it facilitates research. If we only look at the individual, we can never do group studies to gain deeper understanding of these disorders. And so we have to be able to classify people and their experiences with these problems together so that we have large groups of people that we can study further uh, to gain insight. Also, if I'm doing a study on individuals with depression here at Idaho State University, I want to make sure that my colleague who's at, uh, say, Florida State University and doing a study on depression, that he's studying the same thing. And that way we can compare our results to each other. So these diagnostic labels help with the research. Last, it provides an external explanation for the problem. And many people see that as a benefit in that it reduces uh, some of the uh, internal stigma that an individual might experience when they have a disorder. For example, I worked with a client one time who um, she had uh, ADHD. She had been given that diagnosis. Now she, uh, prior to be being given that diagnosis, uh, she just felt like something was wrong with her. She felt like uh, she wasn't capable. She wasn't as smart. She wasn't as intelligent. Uh, she wasn't as patient as her classmates and, and other people that were around her. So she just saw herself as flawed, a flawed individual. But once she was given that diagnosis of ADHD, that changed her thinking completely. It was no longer she's a flawed individual, but she's experiencing a problem. She's experiencing a disorder, similar to somebody who's experiencing diabetes or somebody who has cancer. She has a disorder that can be treated and it's no longer about who she is and her fundamental value. That change in outlook uh, completely changed her life. Uh, she no longer got poor grades because she knew that she wasn't a flawed person anymore. And even though the disorder was still there, she had the same symptoms, she was able to start getting A's in her classes just because she had an explanation uh, for that disorder. However, having these diagnostic labels also comes with a number of limitations. First, they can be very stigmatizing. Within our society, uh, there's a lot of secrecy, a lot of shame and guilt around the psychological disorders. People are often embarrassed to share that they have depression or that they have bipolar disorder. And so putting that label on somebody uh, can be stigmatizing because it sticks with them and other people know about it. Second, it ignores those individual factors. If a person that I'm treating has depression and I have a new client that comes in, that person also has depression. In reality, even though they have the same exact disorder, those two individuals are going to be nothing alike. And so by giving them a label and a name, it, might, it sometimes makes it so as a field we're treating all individuals with that disorder the same. We treat the depression rather than we treat the individual. So it, it uh, removes kind of that, those individual factors from the equation. It also ignores psychological theory. It really uh, makes it so psychological disorders are in line with the medical model and kind of the biological way of thinking uh, and doesn't give credit to uh, the theory behind the development of those disorders. And finally, as we think about limitations for uh, diagnostic labels, uh, we go back to the same thing that was a benefit. It provides an external explanation for the problem.
And so, for some disorders, when an individual has an external explanation, it actually hurts them. So for example, I have worked with several clients where they've uh, had problems with alcohol use. And as we've talked about it or tried to work on it, uh, they've come around to say, well, I can't really change. I have alcoholism. I'm an alcoholic. And so because of that external label, they can't get past or motivated uh, to change their behaviors. Thinking about these benefits and limitations, I want to I wanna throw out a question for you to think about. This was a, a, a adolescent child that I had been called in to do an assessment for in another state again. This was an 11 year old girl. And I want you to think about if you were the psychologist, what would you do? This, to give you some background, this little girl, she was, um, she was bullied in school. As I talked with her, I found out that she had a very chaotic living environment. Uh, parents were uh, not friendly, uh, not kind to her, not supportive to her. Uh, she had to listen often to her parents arguing. And although her parents, they cared about her and they said they loved her, they didn't respond to her in that way. Particularly when she displayed odd symptoms, when she was showing signs of a mental health problem. Now, what her problems were was uh, she kind of fluctuated a lot in her behavior. At times she would act in a way that was very mature and mature at a level that seemed a bit off or a bit odd for her age. And then at other times, very immature, like an infant. And kind of these changes in behaviors or kind of switching from one side to the other was accompanied by very odd behaviors and thoughts at a time. It was clear that she wasn't seeing the world in the way that the average person does. I completed a, a full assessment with her, uh, interviewed her, interviewed her parents, reviewed school material, and did observations of her behavior, and several different psychological assessment measures. And all of this came out to indicate that she met criteria for early onset schizophrenia. That's rare for a child uh, to get a diagnosis that early. But it was a pretty clear evidence that she met criteria for it. I have up on the side discussing groups, but I want you to think about it individually. Feel free to discuss it with uh, roommates or family members if, if they're around, but I want you to think about this a little more. What would the pros and cons be of giving her a diagnosis of schizophrenia at this time? As you think about it, I'm hoping that there's some internal struggle for you, that it's not clear cut whether or not a diagnosis should be given. Obviously, there's some pros to it. There will finally be an answer uh, to that odd behavior, an explanation for why that odd behavior is there. Also, if she gets the diagnosis, there can be early treatment. Uh, with schizophrenia, we know the earlier the treatment begins, the more positive the outcomes are, the more positive prognosis, prognosis uh, there is for the disorder. But what about the cons? If we give her the disorder, we say that she's the problem. It takes out the parental part the chaotic environment that she lives in and the bullying that she experiences and instead kind of puts the blame on her, says the issues with her. Also, that disorder is very stigmatizing. And if we give her that disorder right now, that disorder is going to stick with her throughout her life. She's going to be stuck with it. I hope you see in thinking about this case that yeah, it's not clear cut. 
that your job as a psychologist, even if you know what the answer is, even if you know what the disorder is, it's not always clear cut whether or not you want to give that disorder to a client. All right, let's move a little bit now from talking about the labels that we have, the diagnosis, into how do we come up with that diagnosis? What are the techniques that we use? There's kind of four main categories of techniques that psychologists use in order to uh, kind of uh, assess and diagnose psychological disorders. Clinical interviews, record reviews, behavioral observations, and different psychological measures or tests. And we're going to talk about each of these now. First is a clinical interview. A clinical interview is when a psychologist sits down with the client and talks to them about their problems. Oftentimes within the clinical interview, there'll be an open-ended section where the therapist simply asks the client about their concerns and facilitates the client just to share their viewpoint on it. But then also a section where the therapist, the psychologist, ask very specific questions about symptoms uh, based on the DSM-5 diagnostic criteria. In addition, uh, the psychologist will ask other questions uh, trying to get a good sense of how the disorder developed. What is it in the client's background and history and family that would lead to him or her experiencing the disorder now? These clinical interviews usually last about two hours, with some clients, when it's less clear, uh, it may last several hours, uh, and often done in one appointment, but sometimes spread out um, into several appointments, just as long as it takes for the psychologist to get a good idea what's going on for the individual. These clinical interviews can be structured or unstructured, Unstructured means the psychologist kind of goes with whatever questions comes to her or his mind as they're talking with the client. And structured are interviews where uh, the psychologist asks the exact questions word for word in the same order uh, for every client. Typically, there's the unstructured portion where you're getting the history and the presenting problems for the client. And then sometimes the, when you're talking about the symptoms, that gets into a more structured interview format. With the clinical interview, the psychologist is mainly spending time with the individual patient, but the psychologist often uh, can spend time interviewing others. Uh, for example, a loved one or a family member or teachers or anybody else. For example, I worked with a client in another state one time. Uh, he was coming in uh, because he was having problems in work and problems in his relationship. And as I sat down to interview him, I noticed that he was having difficulty really describing those problems that he was experiencing. Uh, he was downplaying the problems a little bit, but also difficulty finding the right words to describe those problems. And it seemed like perhaps this client had limited uh, intellectual functioning. So a lower kind of uh, IQ, lower level of functioning there. And so for this client, I brought in his wife, with his permission, of course, and interviewed her as well and got her perspective of the problems. Now his wife was a nurse, and so she was able to offer a really clear insight into what was going on. And by having both perspectives, um, it was able to give me uh, details that led to a diagnosis that I probably wouldn't have been able to get if I had just talked to him on his own. It's important to remember, though, that the clinical interview is necessary whenever coming up with a diagnosis for an individual, but it's not sufficient. So you have to do it. It's important. It plays an essential piece, but probably not enough. And I want you to think about why. Usually clinical interviews are not enough uh, because uh, the client may may want to present in a certain way 
either to fake a disorder for some reason or to minimize a disorder for another reason. Also, the clinical interviews depend largely on the individual psychologist. So if we just do clinical interview alone, I might ask one set of questions and another psychologist might ask another set and we come up with completely different diagnoses. And so there has to be something there that's standard or uniform across the field. One other thing with clinical interviews that I forgot to mention on the last slide is they're only a small snapshot of the client's behavior. You're only talking to the client for perhaps two hours to get a, a, an idea of their entire life. And there's no way to get all of the information in that kind of structured environment in such a short amount of time. One of the things that we often add to the clinical interviews that specifically addresses that is record review and behavioral observations. A record review is when a psychologist reviews existing documents to help refine their conclusions. And so this might be school documents like report cards or uh, notes from teachers, times they've spent in the principal office, things like that. It might be medical or psychiatric records, uh, uh, diagnoses that have been given by previous uh, psychologists or doctors. Um, also, uh, other documents that you might ask clients to bring in. Uh, at times, I've asked clients to bring in their journal and allow me to kind of look through their journal to get a better sense of some of their thoughts and feelings. Or perhaps ask them to share with me their Facebook page uh, to get an idea of, of their life and their environment that way. I did want to share another example where uh, I reviewed actually a newspaper article to get a sense of what was going on for an individual client. This was a client who was on an inpatient unit. Uh, she was very kind of hostile client. And when she came into that inpatient setting, all of the doctors were immediately kind of turned off by her, by her kind of anger and hostility. She kept on, this individual client kept on complaining that Walmart was out to get her. She said Walmart was the devil, Walmart was attacking her, they wanted to uh, uh, take her to hell. And that's odd, right? And so the doctors who had immediately met with her thought, okay, this is a delusion, this is what we would call schizophrenia. And so they gave her that diagnosis. However, with that diagnosis, they started to give her medication for schizophrenia and it, it didn't have any impact on her. It wasn't changing things for her. And so they started to wonder, well, maybe we got the diagnosis wrong. So they invited me in to come and do the assessment with this client. And I talked to her. And yeah, she was hostile. Yeah, she was mean. Yeah, she, you know, was stuck on this Walmart thing. But she was coherent in the way she was talking. She didn't show a lot of the other signs of schizophrenia. From my clinical interview alone, I still didn't have a good sense of what was going on for her. But I wondered, what if she's actually telling the truth? What if there's some element in this idea that Walmart was trying to get her? And so I did a search, uh, an online search of the newspapers, and I came across an article uh, that had been published recently in the newspaper uh, that had her in it. And she was arrested at Walmart for shoplifting. And because of this being arrested, I came to realize from this review of the newspaper uh, that it wasn't a delusion. She was just taking kind of some of the facts and taking them to an extreme. And so we were able to change that diagnosis from schizophrenia to borderline personality disorder and get her started on a treatment that quickly started to address uh, several of the symptoms that she was experiencing. So that's what kind of record review is about. In addition, within this category are behavioral observations. The psychologist pays attention during the interview watches how the client responds to the questions, watches how they uh, act with the psychologist. Many psychological offices also have an observation room, particularly for children, where children will play and the psychologist stands behind a, a mirror 
a one-way mirror where they can see through, but the client just sees the mirror, and they watch how does the, the child interact with those toys and interact with the environment. And those observations uh, can be provide lots of useful information. In addition, sometimes psychologists actually go into the environment. When I do, uh, was doing in my training, I at various times was doing assessments of children, and specifically assessments for ADHD and conduct disorders, oppositional defiant disorder. For all of those assessments, I would spend a day, half day, in their classroom. And I just sit in the classroom and record their behaviors. For example, with ADHD, I'd record uh, how often they were on task or off task. And I'd compare that to their peers that were also in the classroom. It gave me a good idea of how does this disorder, if it's ADHD, actually look in their environment. The next kind of category that I want to switch to now are the psychological measures and tests. And as we think about psychological measures and tests, we want to ask ourselves what makes a good test. And there are two things that we need to consider, reliability and validity. Now, first off, I want to say that if you don't have reliability, you can't ever have validity. You have to have reliability first. And what reliability means is every time you do the test, you're going to get the same answer. It's going to give you the same results. So if I do the test today with you and it says you have depression and I do it tomorrow with you, it should still say that you have depression. If I have two individuals who both have depression and I do the test with them, it should reliably say that both of them have depression. But reliability alone is not enough. It also has to be valid. So we see there in the first kind of bullseye that uh, those arrows that were shot into it were very reliable. They all clustered together, gave the same kind of answer or result every time, but it missed the mark. So what we need is when it gives the same answer every time and it's accurate, and that's what validity is, accuracy of the results. So let's look at some examples of the different psychological tests that we use. The first set of tests that psychologists used are behavioral or symptom measures. These are simple measures, forms, that clients fill out. They list the symptoms associated with a disorder, and a client is simply marks if they have that symptom or not. Some of them is yes or no responses, others it's how often the responses occur or uh, provide a little bit about details what it actually looks like for them. The pros of these types of measures are they're very face valid. It's easy to tell what these measures are trying to get at. The cons to that though are it's easy then for a client to lie. If they want to pretend like they have depression, it's easy to know to mark the items uh, like I feel sad and I feel blue and I have thoughts of taking my life. Examples of these types of measures are the Beck Depression Inventory for depression, the Beck Anxiety Inventory for anxiety, and the Beck Hopelessness Scale. There on your slide I give you an example and it's blurry on purpose for copyright reasons. I didn't want to show the actual measure, but you can get a sense what it looks like when a client fills it out. A few other examples, the OQ45 is a general measure of distress that clients complete at their therapy sessions often. And the SCL90, which is a kind of measure of several different disorders all at the same time has 90 questions and so you get kind of lots of different symptoms and answers to lots of different disorders. Another example is the Connors 3. Uh, that's a measure for children uh, about disorders and with that measure there's a self version so the child can complete it but there's also a parent version so the parent answers about the child and a teacher version where the teacher shares what they see. A second category of psychological measures or tests are objective personality measures. Now these are a similar format to the symptom measures except instead of just being face valid kind of symptoms and uh, uh, disorders, uh, 
they're more so tapping into the individual's personality. These are often much longer measures, many more items. Uh, they give more depth and deeper picture. So the pros, they give a richer understanding and it's very hard to fake on these. You often don't know what the right answers look like if you want to get or not get a certain disorder. The cons is they take a long time to take and score. An example of this is the MMPI. The MMPI uh, was developed uh, using all sorts of different items that really by themselves don't mean much. So for example, it has an item about, uh, I like car mechanic magazines, or I like gardening, things like that. Now, your answer to those two individual items doesn't say much about whether or not you have a psychological disorder. But how the MMPI works is there's uh, 500 some questions on it, and your overall answers gives a picture that matches others that may or may not have the disorder. So they've administered that measure to thousands of people, and they've found that uh, individuals who have depression answer it in a certain way. Individuals who have schizophrenia answer it, those questions, in a different way. And for each kind of disorder, there's a profile that exists, similar to uh, what's on the slide there. And so when an individual takes it, they match that individual response pattern to the profile uh, to be able to give insight into whether or not that individual has the disorder. Now, like I said, because it has that profile, it's not clear how you would fake depression. It's not clear whether or not you should say yes or no to liking uh, car magazines. Um, so have a low face validity, uh, but strong kind of uh, validity against being able to fake. Problem with it is it takes a long time. I had one client one time, it was uh, taking her over eight hours just to complete it. Now it probably wasn't valid because it was taking her so long, but uh, it gives you a sense that um, for some individuals, uh, specifically with maybe more severe pathology, it may not be the right test for them. Other examples of personality measures are the PAI and the NEO uh, PIR, both kind of addressing aspects of personality and psychological problems. Another category are projective personality tests. These uh, take it kind of a step further in terms of uh, lower face validity. These projective measures are when clients are presented with an ambiguous stimuli and they have to project onto that ambiguous stimuli their responses. They respond to it saying whatever comes from them. And based on those responses, you can get content that may match certain disorders. So these projective measures provide really rich and detailed understanding of the problems. Clients can't fake on them, or it's very hard to, and it can provide an understanding, or the theory suggests that it can provide an understanding that may not even be known to the client. Cons are, they have a theory-based development. So not as strong of research uh, behind their development. And there's disagreement in the field about uh, how accurate they can actually be. And disagreement about whether or not this unconscious mat material uh, can really give you insight into what's going on in a client's day-to-day -day life. Some examples, and I'll show you at them, but the Rorschach TAT and sentence completion tasks. For example, the sentence completion task. Clients are given a stem to a sentence. These are fake ones, but because of copyright reasons, but maybe I am, and the client responds to the rest of it. I want to, client responds to the rest. So on and so on. This class is, client responds, I hate. Hopefully you wouldn't respond this class. Here's a fake Rorschach. Here with the Rorschach, the client's given an ink blot. They look at this ink blot and they simply tell what they see in that, what they see in that picture. And then based on their response, it gives us as psychologists an idea about what's going on with their psychological functioning.
a final one, the TAT. Again, this is a fake one uh, for copyright reasons, but the client is shown a picture and they're asked to tell a story about the picture. And based on the story that they tell, it gives us insight into what's going on for them. The last category of psychological measures that I want to talk about with this lecture are cognitive and achievement tests, sometimes called neuropsychological measures. Here, clients are asked to perform certain tasks, something like memorize numbers, complete math problems, do logic questions. Uh, on this slide, you see a fake uh, version of the Bender Gestalt where clients are shown this figure and then the figure is taken away and they're asked to draw it again by memory. These responses, whether it's on this one or any of the other cognitive and achievement tests are uh, checked for both speed and accuracy and scores are compared to norms. And based on an individual's ability to you know, do these tasks, we get a sense of their uh, cognitive, uh, intellectual uh, functioning. And get a sense not just of the overall, say, IQ, but areas where they may have weaknesses or areas where they may have strengths. And some examples of this, like I said, the Bender Gestalt, an example I have on the slide, but also IQ tests like the WASTE 4, the WISC 5, and the RAT 4 as an achievement reading test. Okay, well that's it for the lecture on diagnosis and assessment techniques. Uh, hopefully you have a, a good idea of the broad techniques that we use as a psychologist. The code word for today um, for this lecture is assessment. And so in Moodle, go ahead and type in assessment in order to get credit for watching this lecture. And then starting with our next lecture, we'll get into the actual disorders. And we'll start with uh, one of the largest categories, the mood disorders, uh, with depression and bipolar disorder. Again, if there's any questions so far in the course, feel free to contact me by email, and I'll try to my best to answer those questions.